preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, everybody. Francis Sherwood, um, since 1986, has been professor of English at Indiana University in South Bend. She is the author of several acclaimed novels, among them Vindication and countless short stories for which she has won O. Henry Awards and was elected to Penn in 1994. Welcome, Francis Sherwood. In the Book of Splendor, which I hope you all enjoyed as much as I did, we have two parallel stories that converge. One involves mad Emperor Rudolf II of the House of Habsburg and his search for immortality. And the other involves the creation of the legendary golem of Prague, whose purpose, of course, was to protect Jews from impending attack by the citizens of that city. This is a rich and romantic tapestry, part history, part legend, part fiction. The Jewish community of Prague uh, is one of the oldest in Europe. The first evidence of Jewish settlement dates to about the 11th century. But like other communities, Jewish communities all over Europe, it alternated between uh, persecution and protection by various kings. Under Rudolf II and his successor, Matthias, conditions for Jews were actually particularly favorable. In your recreation, Francis Sherwood, of the court of Rudolf II, we meet such real characters as Tycho Brahe, I, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but I'll do my best, and Johannes Kepler, the astronomers, John Dee and Edward Kelly, two British alchemists, as well as Marcus Meisel, who was a prominent court Jew. I'd like to read uh, a little bit from the novel um, to see if we can here in this room bring to life some of what you do so marvelously on the pages of the novel. Um, if you have it first from page 27. Uh, here we are. Prague was filled with such people. Jews who had fled inquisitions and indignities, Armenians like Kirakos, whose country had been taken over by Turks, Germans seeking their fortune, honey-haired whores of Viking blood, Italian craftsmen, alchemists of every religion and region, artists of dubious talent, more priests than anybody liked to see in one place, and pesky Protestants, some of old Hussite families and others who'd followed the Reformation and became the newly minted of Luther's legions. The Jesuits had, of course, made an enclave. And the emperor himself was Austrian, Prague the capital of his empire, which extended over Bohemia, Moravia, Upper and Lower Silesia, the two Lusatias, Austria, of course, Tyrol, Styria, Carinthia, Carniola, the German states, and a piece of Hungary. And then again, page 80. Would you like to read? Um, let me take a look. Okay. <laughs> See if you like this passage. Uh, where, I was thinking uh, of at the middle of the page and with a volley of trumpets uh, okay. to the bottom. Okay. Um, and with a volley of trumpets, off they went in grand procession down Haradkini Hill toward the stone bridge. Despite the cold, and despite the cold, the streets of Prague were crowded with its uncobbled, fetid little alleys, peoples of all class and opinion defecating where they paused. Prague had an odor reputed foul enough to keep the Turks away. Despite that, the city was a center of paper making, book printing, silk and spice, imports from the east. Prague had a glassworks, the emperor's brewery, many monasteries, Charles University, bakeries, a horse market, and a pig business unmatched in Eastern Europe. Powered by the big water wheel of the Vlatava River was an ironworks. Judenstadt, with its rabbi Lowe, was a center for Jewish learning. Maisel, their mayor, had built a, them a bathhouse, a town hall. The Alt Neue Synagogue was one of the oldest synagogues in that part of the world. According to account for tax purposes, the emperor told Vlachlav, 
uh, and Vaclav is sort of the uh, emperor's porter and companion, uh, there were many more than 100,000 people who lived in the city of Prague. This, the emperor said, compared well with Naples, which was reported to be of almost 300,000 people, and so forth. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to add uh, in the little section that she read, because it's very significant for the book, uh, in talking about all of the people that, uh, different people, different nationalities uh, that lived in Prague. And at the end of that paragraph that you started uh, are the words, often forgotten, the Czechs were in Prague right. first. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, That's right. Uh, the city right. dwellers who were merchants, tradesmen, members of the many guilds, laborers, workers and from the country on market day, free peasants, villagers. Thank you. Uh, well, your previous novel, Vindication, is the story of Mary Wollstonecraft, the author of Frankenstein. So you're clearly drawn to historical settings. Um, would you like to talk about this interest and, and how it came about? And, and from what you've told me, you are continuing to pursue it. Um, I, um, I was an English major uh, in college, and uh, I took a few, a few history courses, and uh, they were very boring, uh, and <laughs> I didn't, uh, that wasn't my passion, obviously, uh, but maybe as I got older, and I be, I'm a writer, I'm a late-blooming writer, I, I like to say I'm a slow-writing, late-blooming writer, uh, uh, I, and perhaps as I get older, uh, uh, retrospection uh, is more attractive to me. <laughs> and so in a way, it's like retrospective immortality uh, that is uh, going back in time and looking at things as they were before and, and, and reliving it. And uh, I've just, um, I've acquired that taste. And uh, uh, when I say lately, I mean within the last 20 years. And my writing, uh, which involves, uh, which would be called, uh, uh, in some senses, uh, historical writing, historical novels, uh, all do uh, do go do go back and do involve that kind of of quest. It's kind of a quest, and I also find uh, that um, I mean it's a quest for humanity, and it's really a quest for friends and neighbors and compadres and. Uh, uh, I find that uh, I can most be myself. People talk about is something autobiographical or uh, they talk about autobiographical novels. Uh, I think that uh, uh, my books, even about history and even about historical characters and, and people that are no longer living, in a sense, are the most biographical of my uh, works because in their company and through their beings, I'm able to express myself uh, most freely. So why 17th century Prague in particular? Uh, well, um, accidentally, in a way. Uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, uh, in 1995, um, I got married. Um, for the third time, I got married. Uh, <laughs> and this is the guy. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, he's not ready. Oh, that? he will be shortly. Anyway. We'll, we'll uh, <laughs> as soon as he walks in, we'll all tell him, you're the guy. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, and uh, uh, that summer, uh, I got a job with uh, Amer an American university, actually, uh, the University of New Orleans, and uh, to do a writing uh, seminar for American students. And they do it on many cities of the world, and, and Prague was one, uh, and I wanted to go to Prague. So that's the sort of, and I went, and I fell in love, and it's beautiful, and uh, all, every, all, everything is intact there. There was only one building that was uh, uh, hit by a bomb during the Second World War. Uh, so it's it's very, it's truly, it's not a, you know, we often see reconstructions of things that are supposedly happened or, or I think, you know, that's the way it was, that's the way it is. So I fell in love with the uh, city, but, and, and also the emperor, the whole idea of the, that crazy emperor, uh, but actually uh, part of my family uh, is from Prague. And uh, I did, uh, they came from Prague and they, uh, they died, uh, they were taken from Prague uh, d uh, during the Second World, uh, World War, and they died. And their name is recorded in the synagogue as, as the people that want some of the people that lived in Prague. And so only one of those relatives survived uh, that didn't hadn't gotten out earlier. And so, in a sense, the book is an in homage 
to mm -hmm. them and to that life and those those people. Nice, nice. How did you, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago the um, the real characters, historical characters, personages who appear in your novel. How did you assemble this particular cast, if you like, to situate in uh, in the Book of Splendor? In other words, the astronomers, the the alch these particular alchemists, and so on. Um, they were there. They were just sitting ducks. <laughs> no, it's like, thinking, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, but in why historical somebody... research? You, yeah, you yeah. Uh, I, there was a little uh, maneuvering there. For instance, uh, uh, Tycho Brahe and uh, Janis Kepler were actually there 10 years before the, no the novel, my novel, took place. Uh, they were there... Um, uh, uh, ten years earlier, doing uh, their their uh, uh, and then uh, they 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 were uh, then they were there during my book, but you know they they went through that period, uh, and they were the court astronomers, court mathematicians, and uh, Rudolf was very much a person who gathered uh, brilliance. You know, this is often mm -hmm. the case, right? Not so brilliant yourself, you know, but uh, <laughs> you know the court was uh, uh, filled with uh, uh, luminous mm -hmm. minds. So he had uh, he had them uh, employed there. Uh, um, Kelly, uh, John, uh, 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 John D, and uh, Edward Kelly uh, were brought there uh, a little earlier too uh, to make gold, not to make the elixir uh -huh. of eternal life. That was sort of a subset, but they were brought there to make gold. And if you ever take a trip to Prague, uh, you will see uh, that, that there's an alchemist row, gold, and you, formerly the stables and the alchemists were uh, situated there, and their job was to make gold, you know, uh, all day, more, more, more gold. Uh -huh. And um, so they, uh, th those are all historical characters, and uh, the emperor himself uh, was uh, very much, uh, his very solidly uh, a, a personage uh, of that right. time and place. Right. And mad. And and mad. Yes, uh, I make him uh, in. You know, there's sort of things that. Uh, what what was his problem, right? Um, we, th I think, we could think of him as perhaps uh, manic depressive. But where you know he had his manias, he ha he was insomnia. He has uh, in uh, he had insomnia, uh, great mood swings, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, he was mad mm -hmm. in that respect. Mm -hmm. Well, among the historical characters, we meet as well Rabbi Judah Lowe, uh, head of the Jewish community, and that is where, of course, history and legend intertwine. Um, the legend of the golem is an ancient one. In Talmudic usage, golem used, was used to mean something unformed and imperfect. Um, the golem has been the center of many novels and films. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always been curious about it, and I wonder if, why do you think it has always fascinated people so? Well, um, I think that it's... Um, it's come up to us uh, in history or in tradition. In a way, he's the prototypical uh, monster man, mm -hmm. uh, or the uh, uh, or the puppet, as in Pinocchio, uh, or uh, the and the machine amok. Or and he was in fact the model for Frankenstein, and uh, he's a kind of a King Kong figure, uh, and perhaps we're very attracted. Uh, to that sort of the animal nature uh, of us, and mm -hmm. and and we're also interested in the the obvious outsider, uh, and we're we're uh, obviously interested in uh, and, and like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, we're we're interested in uh, that kind of figure, and especially when it gets out of hand. Right. And we can't control it. And also we're interested, of course, he's a creation, uh, the, the golem and all of these other um, objects mm -hmm. or people or things that I'm talking about are, creator, are being created by, by people, by mankind. And of course, that's God's domain. And this is an example of overreaching and presuming to be godlike, uh, which is, of course, fraught with peril. Uh, so... Thank you. Um, although the golem is created from mud, he was given life through the word emet, truth. 
Um, so here's your description of the process, page 100. On its forehead, the rabbi traced the Hebrew letters. This word meant truth, one of God's names. However, if the first letter were to be removed, the Hebrew letters would spell death. Then the mud man, flat on his back on the bank of the river, the rabbi walked seven times around him, right to left, then seven times the other way. Using the book of creation, the Yetzira, the rabbi recited combinations of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, leading through awe, love, and yearning to the throne itself. These were the holy circles formed by letters with groups of two consonants through which streamed the creative power of the universe. That was how both the cosmos and man were formed, because all things lived through the secret names inside them. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God called the firmament heaven. Moses also using the many secret names of he who is completely unknowable, the hidden of hidden, had parted the seas. Um, implicit in this description, it seems to me, is an homage to the power of creation that resides in words. That's your domain. Um, the golem, this golem is imbued with all of his creator's learning and knows how to write in several languages. And though he is mute, words are at his core. Um, an homage to your own craft, is it? Uh, it thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I didn't think of it that uh, um, specifically. I. I I do, th but I do think of writing in those terms, gen not specific my writing, but mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is to say, uh, I believe in the power of the word. Uh, and of course, uh, there is the idea in the beginning was the word and the word was it. Uh, and the, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Adam and Eve in paradise being able to name, uh, uh, to, to name the animals and so forth. So uh, in fact, cre in, in a sense, create their own world uh, through the act of naming. So uh, I am very attached to that idea. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think the pen is mightier than the sword and all of that. Yeah. Right. Well, once he is activated, this golem becomes, I guess, the perfect man, doesn't he? <laughs> Um, in many ways, I, I mean, did you see him as a prototype? I mean, you can say this quickly before your husband comes in. As a, well, he's very, uh, he's very, uh, traditionally he has been, uh, and if you've ever seen that old silent film, The Golem uh, of the 1920s, he's not a really attractive guy. Uh, but I mean, I decided, but he is. yes, yes, the I is. yes, I decided to make him uh, very attractive. And uh, furthermore, uh, he's mute. Uh, and <laughs> the ideal man. Sure. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I decided that, uh, you know, there are certain uh, things in history that I, I decide, you know, of course, the power of the writer. Well, the golem's going to be good looking, right? Uh, uh, Edward Kelly, who has always been uh, vilified, uh, in, who was a real person, John D. and Edward Kelly, uh, vilified. Well, he's going to ascend to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. For, and, uh, you know, every, and people are going to get their just dues vis-a-vis -vis my book. Uh, so, um Yes, uh, and the thing is, everybody spoke uh, of, of how large the golem is. But of course, in that, in, according to those standards, uh, uh, he, he he was large. But perhaps according to the standards of uh, the 21st century American, uh, he would be maybe uh, the height of a of a basketball, basketball player. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's sort of what I thought. Uh, and at that time, of course, there were fairs uh, and uh, you know carnivals in which the tall people people were, were sent around and, uh, as uh, sort of freak figures. And uh, actually, they would be no, no bigger than a, a rather tall person in, of our time. Well, uh, he is intelligent. He's romantic. He's practical. I mean, he's, he's an effective lover. He's an effective soldier. Um, and uh, I picked out one sentence which said, with the strength of 12 men, Yasala, that is his name, did women's work. <laughs> what, what more can you ask? <laughs> um, well, if, um, 
if I can extrapolate again from Vindication, and it's interesting that you said just a moment ago, and that's the title of your previous novel, but you said just a moment ago that you had the power to, to, to do just that, to vindicate all of these people. Um, so this, this apparently is a concept that you are drawn to. But another theme you're interested in, of course, is the role of women in European history. Um, and to do justice to a summary of the Book of Splendor, one has to include Rachel, who is this 18-year-old illegitimate girl, probably a product of a Cossack rape in Eastern Europe. So she, she and her grandmother um, wandered to Prague um, sometime later, whom uh, Rabbi Lowe and his wife Pearl befriend and protect. And they marry her off to a widowed and much older shoemaker who becomes devoted to her. Unfortunately, she and this newly formed golem become the star-crossed lovers of the novel. Um, and then in a scene sort of reminiscent of the Scarlet Letter, the entire community comes and heaps scorn and abuse on Rahul the adulteress. Um, so, you know, she seems kind of like a Hester Prynne, but the differences are that her illegitimate child dies. Um, her husband is no Roger Chillingworth because he is completely devoted to her, her happiness and well-being. And, of course, religious authority here is very understanding, very forgiving um, of human frailty. So the Jewish community of 17th century Prague was certainly not Puritan America. This part of the novel strikes me as kind of a blend of European romanticism and, and magic realism. Um, the love between Rachel and, and Yasala, you know, who, which, is, which is perfect and impossible and sort of dreamlike. And then there's this tension between science and mysticism right, uh, in the figures of both the astronomers and the alchemists. And then there are these Gothic elements like the, um, oh, uh, the, the paraplegic, uh, the junkman, uh, who saves Rachel from the mob. Um, do you identify with these literary movements? Um, I'm not sure I identify with them, but I, I'm certainly aware of, of them. And uh, I felt very um, free to, to tap into, you know, certain traditions when you're saying it's sort of gothic. Uh, certainly the, the story of uh, Rachel, I, um, uh, I, she's a, kind of a Cinderella figure in a way, so that's a, a fairy tale, except uh, I did a little, you know, a Cinderella was the person who had to sweep the ashes, but uh, what I, and, and I'm always sort of tipping my hand or my head or something, uh, my hat, uh, to the 20th century as well, uh, because uh, uh, she was a Cinderella figure who went through the oven, she escaped. She 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 escaped through the ashes. Through the she went through the oven, came out on the other side, and and was a, and survived. Mm -hmm. Because uh, remember, I, the, she's in a room. Uh, the emperor is about to come in and rape her, and the, uh, and so the, how she escapes is going going through the oven. So uh, there's there's always a little you know in a way I'm sort of playing with my my own sensibility there. So she, in a way, she's like a phoenix. She mm -hmm. rises from the ashes. Uh, she comes, she comes through. Uh, the magic realism uh, is, you know, perhaps uh, through reading uh, Latin American writers, mm -hmm. but also uh, if you think of the figure, uh, the paintings of, of Chagall, or if you think of the stories of Isaac uh, uh, Mushevis Singer, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, you know, in his folk tales uh, uh, about Poland are all, you know, with mystical and and wonderful figures uh, uh, coming in. Uh, what what else did you say? Was there? Well, well, I mentioned yeah. romanticism, yeah. Uh, magic realism, and, yeah, and the gothic aspects of yeah. romanticism. I guess. I, I mean, there were certain scenes that reminded me very much of Hugo's novels. You know, sure. Sort of and if you go to Prague, uh, there's uh, you know there's it's a city of alley alleyways, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there's go you know this is kind of corny, but 
you know, I I enjoyed it. Going on ghost tours, right, uh, and through the alleys, and so and so got murdered here, and you know, and stories and and so forth. And uh, uh, a lot of the literature of Prague, uh, and you think of Kafka, who's also you know from that area, sure. and uh, his feeling for the for the uh, castle and his gloominess, and uh, that sort of that whole atmosphere uh, permeated my my sensibility during the mm -hmm. writing of that novel. What struck me. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Rahal coming through the oven. Um, what struck me, of course, is that she's saved by a woman. She's saved by the, the mistress of the emperor, who has her own ulterior motives because she doesn't want to be replaced. But it was interesting to me that she was saved by a woman because there are these strong feminist currents, um, I think, in the novel. I see certain heads nodding in response yeah. to that. Well, I mean, in the fact that uh, um, uh, she's uh, Rahel is illiterate, and and she, of course, like everybody else during that time, uh, and mm -hmm. particularly the women, and certainly the the men, uh, maybe not the men of the Jewish community as such. In fact, of the whole society, that was probably the most literate uh, uh, group of people uh, in that city. But uh, she was illiterate; she felt it, uh, and at the end of the novel her achievement is to be able to read and, and write and uh, uh, to be able to, un to really understand the prayers that she's reciting and, and to be a leader of, of the women's group. So uh, it's, I think, uh, you know, there are definitely is a feminist. Uh, uh, I try to carry her through the, the uh, sort of a, uh, if you read novels, uh, like if you read Madame Bovary, you read Anna uh, Karenin, you know, the way that women in those traditional older novels express their independence or their difference was to have an adulterous affair. That, you know, that was the only out. It's, you know, sex, you know, marry, marry sex or ultra married, uh, 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 extramarital sex. So sex was an expression of independence, having sex with, with somebody other than your husband. Well, she did that, yes, uh, but then uh, she all, she works beyond, and beyond that and hopefully reaches a point of real redemption and real self-knowledge, which is not, ha you know, not adultery, which is my belief, it's not, not you know, uh, n not to say anything against adultery, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but she goes beyond that. She goes to be. She comes to be a more self-realized person, and that comes uh, through uh, through study, reflection, uh, uh, through intellect versus uh, uh, and intellect, the emotional life and intellect uh, uh, going together versus uh, just uh, emotion, body, or body as the only avenue of expression. Yes. And I wondered if the reason you made her barren was also to give her liberation, to give her the time for her studies. Um, and also sort of not to tie her, to kill her the way her, mother, her own mother had been killed by giving birth. Yeah, that, that's, that was a difficult thing. And sometimes we're not quite aware of what we write. You know, um, I didn't make her barren uh, so that she could be learned. Uh, because that would be terrible, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I, I just felt uh, at first she was killed in the book. By the way, she uh, in the scene uh, that uh, where she's being stoned, she was actually stoned to death. And my when my editor read that, she said, "Oh no, don't do that." <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, she's the heart of the book. So, you know, I got her on her feet again, uh, <laughs> but she, you know, and, and it had to, we, the book had to end happily, but it, everything can't work out. So that's part of it. So she didn't have children. But I also wanted to uh, uh, indicate that she could have a fulfilled life without children. And I mean, it's not a pre, you know, uh, uh, not having children is not a prerequisite for for uh, of having a fill, fulfilled life or having a learned life or making it make, making it easier. Maybe it, it does though, but uh, it, it's just like it's a price that she paid on the on the way. It's a, a very sad, sad price that she paid on the way. Yes, w within the context of the novel, there is that sense of retribution uh, in her not being able to have a child after. Uh, you know this pregnancy from the golem. Um, so there are there are these these 
despite the fantastical elements, there are some fascinating characters here. Um, one of the ones that I really enjoyed was Kirakos, the Armenian who turns out to be a, a, a spy for the Turks. Um, Vaklav, the valet that you mentioned, who's torn between duty to the monarch and, of course, fear for his own life and his devotion to his family, which is beautifully depicted. And then there's Pearl, since we're talking about women. Pearl, the rabbi's wife. Um, kind of a 17th century Golda, real Aetius Heil, um, who, who forms a very interesting contrast, of course, to the Rachel as she will eventually evolve. Um, do, how, how do you feel about, about Pearl? Oh, she, she's my um, a Pearl, <laughs> <laughs> beyond compare. Uh, she, uh, and in fact, at the end, uh, uh, I, when I say that Rachel wears glasses, uh, like, you know, the same glasses like Pearl, it's like she has evolved uh, to that stage of life that she can be like that very, very good woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, I wanted to make her uh, a little harsh. Yes. Uh, the, I wanted to make her very strong. And in fact, uh, Rabbi Lowe uh, uh, was married uh, to a woman who uh, had shares some of the history as of my character there. That is to say, uh, uh, her uh, family lost her dowry, and uh, she then went to work uh, as a baker in a bakery and earned back her dowry. And uh, as we know, uh, certainly uh, in the society in which you have the men being uh, the learned ones and doing the studying and being the rabbis, you know, the women are are not, are you know not only there at home but the, but working and holding down the fort. So she she's very much uh, in that uh, tradition, and, and she was one of my favorite characters. Well, she does the work of 12 golems. That's you know? right, that's right. And she's very smart. Uh, uh, she's uh, uh, judicious. Yeah, well, she's cautious, but she, you know, she doesn't uh, leap before she steps and... Uh, um, uh, you know, she, she says, uh, yeah, she, she does. Around. And she's kind of droll. You know, she, 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 she understands her husband very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this lady, what uh, oh, was her question? Sorry. I liked her a lot. I was very disappointed that her two daughters were so, <laughs> so where is all that role model? Well, those are Cinderella's <laughs> sisters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to have a, so I wanted to have some some jealousy there. Uh, you know, it's often the case that great people uh, have disappointing children. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> But they were both, um, I, you know, it's funny for me to talk about my characters because I think of them as independent from me, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, so that I can praise them and I'm not praising them. Uh, they were both big enough people that they could re they could look and say that, you know, this was our lax, but they rise above it and, and do well, do good anyway. I mean, there's some people that get older and have a great deal of resentment toward those who are younger, more passionate, you know, and so were their experiences. And, but they didn't, they didn't, they weren't limited in, in that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's. <laughs> yes. I um, I would. I'm actually curious as to how you would compare the character of Rochelle to the character of Hester Prynne, because I noticed that that uh -huh. that comparison struck me too. But I kind of felt that in the Scarlet Letter, it was clear, very clear that Hester Prynne had sinned, and in this in this case, I kind of got the sense that this was the monumental event. Of this path, you know, this relationship with. Um, was sort of like the monumental event of her life. It's not clear that she'd sinned. It's more that at that moment her life was almost fulfilled. Whereas Hester, in, in terms of a trans transformation, I think it's you know maybe similar in both books. But one is you know in Hester Prynne it's more through sin, whereas this is through you know some kind of you know realization or you know the true of a true relationship. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah, I see. I it's. I really didn't think about the Scarlet Letter that much uh, when I, I was aware of it. Uh, it's funny because one of the, you know, the Hawthorne things that I really thought about was this short story called Rappuccini's Garden, mm -hmm. uh, which is a creation story about uh, somebody that makes a beautiful flower in the garden, you know, and it, he steps beyond his bounds like the like a rabbi making all. Um, I think that in... I think maybe it's my idea, my, you know, sort of my idea of the of sin versus Hawthorne's or uh, my lack of idea of sin. Uh, that is to say, she did wrong, grievous wrong. Uh, her husband was dear and wonderful and loved her, and she did not give him a chance. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in my book, uh, and that and that was wrong. Uh, however, to fall in love with another man uh, who was, they were both outsiders, the Gollum, and, and, and they corresponded to each other. You know, he was mute. She was, she was a kind of a foreigner in her community. They really corresponded to each other there, and I, I tried to make that pretty apparent. She never was permitted to talk. And if you notice in all the conversations with her husband, the husband is always talking, 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 and she can't get in the word edgewise. With uh, Yasel, she could talk to her hearts. To, she could talk for him. She could be his interpreter, you know, etc. So they were kind of a perfect match. Uh, that she had to lose her child uh, and that she had to endanger the Jewish community was grievous. I mean, a grievous sin. But I didn't think of her act of adultery as uh, irreparable. You know, I didn't think of it as uh, a morally terrible guilt forever. You know, no. That's just a, a difference of writers and, and a difference in time, too. Sure. You know? And a different in a difference in perspectives, and and of course Hawthorne, we're, and Hawthorne and I are separated by a lot more than time, and also being female, by the way, uh, you know I think that I think that um, and if I don't want to indulge in stereotypes, but um, uh, permit me to think of women as more gentle. So a female writer would. No, would be less judgmental and be and understand things like adultery, things like murder, things like d death and devastation, things like loss, like great loss. But what the two characters I think have in common is that they do both transcend themselves uh, in the process, and I think maybe that's what you are sensing also. Yes. Mathematicians, etc., was not as passionate or alert as when the learned parts were said. So I love that the passion was what people needed to bring to an object that had no passion. It sort of brought the passion from the other people into the golem as a reflection. I, I saw it, and so to me that brought out the souls of all the people that were near the golem. Sure, uh, and that's, I mean, um, again, I'm, th I'm thinking of my book as separate from, you know, like I teach English and we analyze literature and so forth. The golem is kind of the empty vessel that, that is uh, in which the light is, is uh, retracts the light and the light is fed into it. And uh, uh, despite everything awful he did, he's a, he is a godlike figure. Yeah, perhaps. I think that's being very smart about that. Uh, <laughs> smarter than I am, uh, because uh, yes, and uh, you know, I wasn't think uh, sin was not. You know, I wasn't writing the book with a big S on my forehead. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like uh, my my orientation. But and I do make a distinction between sin and and uh, uh, sin and, and and love and true love no well you know yes since Yasso was not a real person is it, 
there are, is a he and uh, Ruckel a metaphor for something? Um, I think that um, um, every, but everything in the book is kind of a metaphor for something. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm talking about being analytical. I don't like to really be that analytical. But um, if you look at the, uh, um, uh, Margot mentioned uh, the rag and bone man. Uh, okay, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, he's sort of, he's, he, sta he stands as a kind of a, uh, he stands for a metaphor uh, of a person that's overlooked. Now, he didn't have any, he didn't have any legs. He collected junk. He had, he was extremely poor. The only thing he had was his, his pathetic animal. And yet he was able to make a, a, a goodness out of his life. He was a hero, uh, and um, he was kind of a metaphor for, for the person that's overlooked. Uh, Vaclav, who was the servant of the, uh, of the emperor, and of course Vaclav was named after Vaclav Havel, who was the Czech, first Czech president, uh, is a, a metaphor for, for Czech nationalism. And, uh, uh, and uh, there's lots of, um, there's a symbol if, um, you know, when you go to the Czech Republic, there are a lot of lanterns and I, I, they took them off the last time I was, I was there, but you, uh, one time I was there and the little uh, boats that go across, uh, the recreational rowboats that go across the Vlatava River had little lanterns on them. But they were, that's all a symbol of the, uh, sort of the liberation of the, the Czech people. So, so he was a, sim a symbol. Uh, 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 Zev uh, was was you know we talk about uh, the um, we talk about varieties of of husbands or or how to be a husband and and uh, Zev uh, as a cobbler was you know you know he was also uh, 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 you know a man of the earth with a very big soul you know a man who's able to encompass uh uh forgiveness uh that is ex extraordinary uh, uh uh rachel was uh you know she's sort of like every woman and during the medieval times the, uh, within the christian tradition they had the figure of every man right in which the devil and uh, the angel were vying for the soul uh uh for that person well rachel was every woman within the jewish tradition uh, and so it, I am playing those games there, but I, I don't like to be too self-conscious about it. And if you go, go through the, the whole thing, the, uh, uh, Kepler and, uh, the alchemists, you can find correspondences and they can be representative of larger entities and ideas than just themselves. But mainly I want it to be just a good story, you know, to take and be taken just as a simple story, you know, this is a simple story. There were, uh, uh, you know, four rabbis uh, on the way to Jerusalem, and they sat under a tree every night and told a story. <laughs> you know, it's a very simple thing. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever have uh, Well, here's what I loved in your description of, of Rachel, um, because she she... There's a scene of her in the mikvah, in the ritual bath, and she glories in her body, which is free and hers. And I'm quoting, she stood straight up in the bathhouse, shoulders squared, her feet planted on the floor, her buttocks thrust out. And then we have, juxtaposed to that, Rahul in bed early in the novel with her husband. Rahul held herself steady clutching the sides of the bed while he rocked above her. She would have the strange premonition that she was sliding off the edge of the world into a swirling dust, would be lost forever, never known. And so, of course, you know, it's important that she she finds herself through Yassel, um, as I read it, and, and as you point out, she finds her, her voice, both literally and figuratively. Um, so I'm, you know, I was wondering whether you have any real life models, literary models um, in Rahul, or, or for that matter, in any of your characters, inspirations that you'd like to tell us about? Um, well, I was um, talking about my family. A part of my family um, was from from Prague, uh, and uh, 
another part of the family, you know, in, originally um, Rachel uh, came from uh, Kiev, uh, a village near Kiev, um, and uh, that's another part of my family. <laughs> Uh, except they didn't stop in Prague. They went all the way to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that, uh, and in fact, uh, I used uh, the the people that uh, were in Prague. I used Zeb's last name, Werner, uh, is uh, my um, grandmother's last, you know, there's lots of little things like that. My grandmother's last name. Uh, 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 Rachel was a, a seamstress uh, and, um, my mom was, mm -hmm. uh, and worked in uh, a garment factory, worked in garment factories. Uh, and uh, so I, I, she was a, a needle woman uh, very much. And so that's sort of uh, uh, very, very personal to me. And actually uh, when I, I've been spending the week here in New York and I visited the, uh, the uh, tent, Lower East Side tenement. And uh, I also went to the, um, uh, museum of, I guess, the Museum of, of New York History, that one that's by um, Natural History, uh, yeah, and saw the sewing uh, um, display. I'm very interested in, I'm very interested in sewing because, not that I'm a good sewer or, or a needlewoman and I, you know, if I need a scarf, it's, it looks weird, but... Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's you know my it's my history, uh, so that history kind of uh, crept in into my book. Uh, um, um, Rachel is a, a vegetarian, uh, so am I. Uh, you know little things like that. As far as uh, uh, mentor figures, um, no, absolutely none. Uh, <laughs> How about in the literary world? It, uh, um, in the literary world, uh, there are people, I mean, of course I read books and there are books that I like and writers that I like, uh, and different writers were very important to me at different times. Um, I kind of, um, I was very interested at one time, uh, not le much less interested now in Grace Paley, uh, because she was a writer, short story writer, and she was a, a working class woman who was a, a mother, uh, and so, and she wrote even though she was you know, poor working and so so I liked her. Uh, I uh, uh, then uh, I did study with John Barth, and uh, uh, he was uh, experimental, and and I was very um, felt very liberated uh, by his work. Um, I read um, I read historical novels. Uh, I read uh, I read recently. It's on the bestseller list, and I'm. Uh, you know, absolutely blue with jealousy. Uh, and I don't think that book is that good. But uh, <laughs> The Birth of Venus, which is on the best, it's a historical novel, uh, uh, and it's on the bestseller list. And it's about Venice, uh, uh, I guess in the 15th, in the 16th century, maybe 15th or 16th century. Uh, and uh, I really impressed by uh, Doctoro's Ragtime. Wonderful book, mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, I like the uh, works of Russell Banks uh, very much. I just, I wish, you know, he kind of sits down and just tells an old story. And I just wish, uh, you know, to do that without, you know, without a sense of artifice. Um, I like Jeanette, a, a British writer, Jeanette Winterston, uh, Winterstein's, Winterstun's uh, book, uh, The Passion, which is about a, a Napoleon's cook. Uh, and it was, it's a, it's a historical novel. And I thought, wow, he's writing about a cook. And, you know, so I can write about kitchens. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, it's just like, uh, um, I, when I read something good, that's what I, I feel. Well, I can do that. And of course, Marquez is 100 Years of Solitude and all that gorgeous magic realism. Uh, I, I, there were certain books that I read that helped me in, in writing the Book of Splendor and certain experiences I had that, that really lent to that book. How long was it germinating? Five years. Not is yet. that... How does that compare to your other experiences? The same. <laughs> it usually takes about five years uh, because I do my own research and uh, a lot of my research is uh, uh, walking research, uh, uh, sort of going places and looking at things and 
uh, looking at clothing, looking at, uh, you know, the castle in Prague, which is a wonderful place to see. Uh, when I was there one time, I went there to an alchemy conference put on by the Open University of New York. And uh, uh, learning about that and seeing all the tools that they used in the alchemy uh, laboratories. Uh, I also saw displays of toys of the 16th century, um, recipe books, of, you know. Uh, it, it, people tend to think of research as pretty dry, but the kind of research I do is, is not at all. Do you take notes on these travels yes. or do you have mm -hmm. a phenomenal memory? <laughs> no, I, I, I take notes. Yeah, I take notes and uh, uh, go over notes, write, uh, write them. You know, I don't travel with a laptop. So, I mean, usually the way I travel is uh, uh, pretty seat, you know, seat of the pants travel. So I, I have a notebook um, and then I put them in my, the notes in my computer and they're there. And, but then when I come time to, when it comes time to write, I just, I just have it. This goes. Mm. Um, did Rudolph really keep a pet lion? Yes, he really did. And that's the real name of the lion. Pataka. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the lion is, is so often, of course, a symbol of majesty. But Pataka is this poor, enfeebled, crippled, powerless creature reflection of his kingdom? Um, yeah, but they see, but also on the other side, Rabbi Lowe, Judah the, you know, Judah the lion. And uh, so we and have the, yeah, oh, yeah. so <laughs> anyway, it's like, uh, uh, we have those, that pairing. Beautiful irony, of, right? Yeah. Beautiful irony. So is there something that, uh, you know, I thought a suggestion kind of, of the survival of, you know, the Jewish people um, in Judah Lowe, whose name is Dub is related uh, to the Rabbi Low. Yes. <laughs> and right. you would be surprised. I, I mean, that. there's somebody in my town, South Bend, Indiana, who claims to be related to Rabbi Low. <laughs> but nobody, nobody ever says, well, I'm related to the Rudolph, Rudolph Habsburg. Habsburg. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, tell us about what's coming down the pike. What should we look for by Francis Sherwood? Um, well, I'm writing a, a, a new novel set in Mexico uh, about a woman who is, uh, was a translator and interpreter for Cortez, uh, an Aztec woman, and her name in Spanish is uh, uh, Malenque, and uh, her word, her name is used nowadays uh, in Mexico uh, to describe a traitor or somebody who likes foreign things, and she's been vilified. Did you say, I'm sorry, did you say traitor or traitor? Traitor, traitor a ba bad, uh, a disloyal person, uh -huh. uh, and uh, because she's considered a, a sellout uh, to the Spanish. Her, her Aztec name was Malitzin. Uh, she was sold into slavery by her mother when she was 10 years old, and she was given to Cortez as a, a sort of, you know, here, have our women, um, uh, with a group of 19 other women. So I'm writing about that. Uh, I'm writing um, a collection of stories uh, about um, uh, some uh, West Indian immigrants. One of the stories is going to be uh, published in May in uh, the magazine um, Zoetrope. Uh, one of the first story in that series was uh, published uh, in the Atlantic Monthly and um, called Basil the Dog. Uh, the one in Zoetrope is called Pilgrims. And I have other books I'm, you know. Terribly prolific. Yeah. Oh. Wonderful. Um, have you traveled to Mexico recently then? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when the, I, you know, I never, I never set a book in a place I wouldn't want to live in forever. <laughs> not, uh, in not in New York. <laughs> well. Um, nice, place, <laughs> nice place to visit. <laughs> um, you know, New York has been done so much. Uh, <laughs> I'm, no, I'm not so kidding. Woody Allen especially. Uh, and everybody. I mean, it, it's, it's, all, it's already in the hands of masters. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so I've been to Mexico. We're going, going again. And that, that's the new biggest project. And, and I always, I write short stories. My, uh, I write, um, I write stories about the Midwest. I live in Indiana. And uh, I have a group of uh, stories that I've been publishing uh, that I call Heartland Stories. Uh, about, you know, 
drudgy life where the land is flat and, and nobody's out on the streets and it's quiet and lonely uh, and you can write books. <laughs> so your stories are quite different, it strikes me. Yes, from they're the contemporary. That, yeah, mm -hmm. my stories are much are con sort of contemporary, uh, s slippery story. I mean, they're they're slippery. not. Yeah, well, they're sort of slippery, slick, you know, a little jazzy. They're different than different style. And how does that happen? I mean, I don't know. The Just schizophrenia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's sort of like, oh, I'm, you know, th this is so much work, this novel. I have, so, you know, uh, look, I'm thinking of 300 pages. Well, let me take a t little time off, exactly. right? And, but a little time off off when it ends up, you know, two or three months. But anyway, um, it, it's sort of like that. But that's know. okay, because you have five years to write this novel. You know that, so. Yeah, but I'm not that young, vacations. you know. It's just a little. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a, you know, what am I going to do here? Questions, comments, please join us. Yes. yes. In the five years, is that including your research and the actual writing? Yeah. And are they kind of contemporaneous, or do you finish the research and then start writing, and you're mm -hmm. done with the research? I do the, most of the research first. I certainly do all the traveling research first, and then if I have to go back and check things, uh, I'll do that while I'm doing the writing. Or if I have to, uh, um, if I've lost the feeling. Uh, which is very important to me, uh, then, I, I, then I go back. So sometimes I do some of the research simultaneously. That is, I do the writing in the morning and the uh, reading uh, uh, in the evening and the editing in the afternoon. And um, so some of it overlaps, but mostly I do the research first. Though I have an idea and I, I do little bits and pieces. Yeah. Understand what happens to Rudolph at the end? Uh, yeah, he and, and I. I hope we're not spoiling this for everybody. Uh, he's buried alive by his son, his illegitimate son Vaclav, who takes who, according to the prophecy. Remember, he didn't have any legitimate children, which was a real prophecy, uh, and uh, uh, given to him. You know, his astronomers were also his astrologers, and Brahe did prophesy that he would be killed by his son, so he didn't have any sons. But uh, uh, um, Vakla was the Ill illegitimate son, and he he buried uh, his uh, uh, his father alive. Now. The real, that's fiction, that's my book. Uh, the real Rudolph uh, was uh, uh, sort of arrested, uh, or what I would say confined to castle by his brother, uh, Matthias, who was wanting to take over the uh, throne anyway. And his paranoia about his brother was actually very well founded. And so uh, that's the real story. And then he finally died and his, and his brother took over. In your book, you have him chanting the word death, and I almost saw him devolving like the golem did, returning to the earth as opposed to That's being buried point. alive. Well, he did return to the earth. <laughs> It's a nice parallel. <laughs> yeah, uh, he went back uh, uh, to whence he came, uh, but not voluntarily. And and he, uh, I hope I made it clear in my book that he was very muddled at the end, and he had periods of lucidity and, and periods of being very muddled, and that is actually quite true. One of the things about working with that material, though, is that a lot of the records of the, of the court records and, uh, and, and what went on with Rudolf uh, were burned during the Thirty Years' War subsequently. So um, there, of course, is a lot of material in Rudolf, but not as much as one would like, but good, certainly good enough if you're a novelist, right? And I, so I did what I wanted with that. Yes? Who was in 
love with the person who was supposed to defend them. Um, I, I found that um, disturbing. Um, uh huh. That the golem who was supposed to defend these people uh, was in love with somebody, yet they took that person and they were going to stone them. Well, the uh, the people that were going to stone her, your stone uh, uh, Rochelle, stone, stone uh, Rachel, Rochelle, uh, w was not her own community, but the townspeople. She was out. So Judenstadt, even if you go to Prague today, is a walled. Uh, it's a walled neighborhood. No, they weren't Jews. But that's not saying that everybody in the Jewish community loved her, and particularly the rabbi's daughters did not love her. But she was being going to be stoned as an adulterer, you know, for many reasons. First of all, the the townspeople. Uh, uh, were extremely uh, hostile toward the Jewish community in, in general and per, and per se. Uh, she, as a representative of that, and yet also as an outsider and as an adulteress, uh, she, uh, they were the people that were throwing the stones and that were being stoned uh, uh, at that time. Now, the uh, Yassel, the golem, was... Uh, uh, was made, and this is historically, or by, not historically, but certainly by legend, was made to protect the Jewish community. Uh, and as, you know, and remember that when they're planning, the they know they're going to be assaulted by the town people. You know, they have to worry about the emperor because uh, he wants, you know, he wants his elixir or else. Uh, the townspeople by, led by Thaddeus, that priest, which is a historical, Thaddeus was in fact a very evil person, uh, uh, unfortunately, who lived at that time, who was uh, after the Jewish community, and particularly the Rabbi Lowe, who was uh, a great intellect of his time and followed and revered by uh, his community and by members outside the community. So he had doubly, uh, double things against uh, 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 the Jewish community and Rabbi Lo. So to sort of backtrack, Yasu was made to protect the, the community, but and they said to him on the night of planning, you know, you are you are our David, right? And then he says to him to them, uh, uh, you are our Goliath. And then he says to them, no, we are all of the house of David. And so he didn't protect them. They protected themselves. They all, everybody protected their, you know, this is our, as miserable as this community is, you know, it was, and they rented their houses. They couldn't even own their houses. Their graveyard was, uh, that they weren't allowed to live outside of the borders of that wall. And their dead had to be, live there too. And so if you go to uh, Prague now, the graveyard is very high because uh, uh, generation upon generation is buried there. Uh, no more room was to be had to be, be buried Jews. They couldn't be buried at that time outside of the walls of the Jewish community. So the Jews protected, with the help in my book, with the help of Yasso, protected that community. Yeah, okay, I, I misunderstood. Yeah. I I they, understood that they were Jews at Stones, and that's the part that I got yeah. confused. Yeah, uh, yeah they, they didn't. It, it was the townspeople who were, uh, you know, and I make sure the crowd, uh, you know, the crowd is very hostile, it's, uh, full of drunkards, uh, uh, ne'er-do-wells. And, of course, then other people who should very well know better of the town join. But I also made sure that there were some redeeming Christians. Uh, there's certainly uh, uh, the, the junk man. Right, and uh, Kyrakos was a ambiguous figure. That is to say, uh, he uh, he's Muslim. Uh, he was actually, uh, uh, he was Armenian, but Armenia was taken over by the Ottoman Turks, and so he was brought up uh, uh, in uh, uh, the Muslim court or the, under Muslim influence uh, and was sort of sent as a spy to the court. But then uh, in saving Vaclav's son, remember, of smallpox, uh, he became a better person for it and be and through being sick himself uh surviving his own sickness uh, uh was able to uh, become transformed into a better person so i gave everybody a chance there uh, <laughs> yeah. yes you know as you talked you talked about the golden character as a piece of a real person 
person. And I, I get mixed up when I read magical realism because I'm reading it and I, there's always this barrier of knowing it's not real, you know, that it doesn't make sense, you know. And so I, I don't, I never really understand magical realism, what the idea of it is. Um. Uh, maybe you're too logical a reader. No, really, I'm not kidding you. Uh, and uh, you know, when you were a kid, you could you do and you read books that animals talked and so forth. You know, that all the books are all they kids' books. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so you, I mean, you have to kind of sur the way you read books like that is you you just surrender yourself to them. You know, you got to put that sort of logical apparatus. Uh, you know, oh, this can't be true or this is weird. You just put it away for a while. And people, you know, it's, that's, but that's very akin to any kind of reading, which is entertainment and escape and sort of magic. Yeah. Back, please. Yeah. Yeah, he, he knew, and it's very interesting. Vaclav looked just like his dad, uh, you know, and that the Habsburgs uh, had very a very characteristic look. They had the very jutting chin and the red crinkly hair, and uh, uh, their chin was, they all wore beards because they their chin, and when I say jutting chin, we're talking, you know, uh, and... Uh, they all so they all the guys all the male Habsburgs wore wore beards and they were very ashamed about their some of their physical attributes and uh, they dug up they, they finally found out and it came from some relative a female relative right uh, <laughs> uh, way long ago uh, and she wasn't Austrian so uh, uh, she was Bulgarian or Hungarian or you know whatever uh, so uh, yes he recognized him as his son and and of course remember he's uh, he passes the SATs to get to be so to speak you know he's given those puzzles actually those are men's men's questions uh, <laughs> I filched for that uh, 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 so he passed and, and he's promoted. Now it's interesting that he that the he never I make a big point that they never look at each other, you know, and it's always Vaclav is always like standing side to side. Uh, and so he's never really acknowledged. He's never looked at in the eyes. And yet, of all the people in the world, he's the only one to whom the emperor can confine. I mean, he's a, a case, and this is a sort of a stereotype, you know, the 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 lonely uh, despot. You know, everything in the world. He has everything in the world. And Vaclav tells him that, right? When he's depressed, oh, you have, you know, countries and riches and you're handsome. Yes, I am handsome. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question? Um, just question Maybe I'm, tell me if I'm overanalyzing this, but I kind of saw like the Gollum and Rochelle kind of together in terms of, you know, the Gollum maybe highlighting. Well, I guess I read it as Rochelle's life in the end, you, know, you sort of feel that she's, her life has, you know, somewhat become fulfilled. She's sort of achieved her, you know, unique destiny. She's, you know, found, found her voice maybe through her needlework and then eventually through learning to read and telling stories. Whereas someone like the Gollum, you get the sense that his intellect is, you know, the equivalent of Rabbi Lowe's. And it's, you know, his intellect... Well, he, it's, he's, he's his father, you know. Yeah. <laughs> So he has nothing else. He has no childhood. He has no, you know, sort of potential. And so you kind of see them together, whereas you kind of are happy for Rochelle, and you just kind of feel that the Gollum is just the most tragic character in the book. And I kind of saw that as, you know, just highlighting, you know, how you're supposed to feel about Rochelle's life, you know, in a sense. So it's not so much that. Well, she always loves him. I mean, in the end, in memory, she's true to her memory. Uh, to her love, she's true to her love for him, but she also very dearly loves, comes to love her husband. Uh, he, the, the golem had to go. Uh, <laughs> historically, traditionally, in lore, he's always put down. He always has the, a rampage. 
and if you read any Golem story, uh, uh, he has that rampage, and that letter has to be erased, and he has to be he has to be put down. Uh, you know, and it, you're you're thinking, well, you're writing a novel. You did. You're, you're here. You're up saying, telling us you did what you want. Uh, why didn't you make him? Why didn't you make them go over the hills happily to another town? But they did wrong. They, they, you know, they did it. There, it, it was an adulterous affair. Her, her, she lost her baby through her uh, copulation with him. He, uh, it, you know, they. It, it could not be. She was. I mean, here I'm being very heavy duty moralistic. You know, you married your husband, so, but uh, within the law, I, I couldn't have him. I couldn't have. I, in a way, I said, oh, you know, I don't want him to go. I don't want them to part. You know, I, I had them that at one point I had them there up on that hill, and she's going down to town, and he's going to go up over the hill, uh, uh, you know, and live his other life. Maybe he would join that fair. Remember that fair that came through town, and he would be the tall man, and so forth. In that in that fair, uh, but uh, he had to come home and face the music. Uh, and his father didn't want to put him down, but um, there, there, was no, there was no future for him. There was no real hope for him. He was one of the sad figures in that book and in, in, in life that don't survive, don't survive. But you see, the way I think of him is that he, he, he is very much a part of the tradition and he has to remain where he is so that he can be resurrected from time to time when we need him. You know, if he is going to be fulfilled in an earthly mortal way, uh, he will die in a mortal way. And this way he doesn't. You know, he remains in a way yeah. immortal. That's my reading. Supposedly, according to the legend, uh, the the dust. Uh, you know, he's he's up in the attic with the books, uh, the tattered old books, and that um, that he is from time to time uh, resurrected or can be resurrected, and come back. That's the beauty of power of legends. Yeah. I was going to add that he Well, um, <laughs> it better be Laura. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yes, there's lots of stories. Uh, rabbis who. Well, it was certainly the 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 golem. There's a story of of uh, two rabbis making a calf. Uh, the, and there's also there's there's supposed to be uh, okay there's the golem of Prague and there was uh, I'm thinking if there's uh, there was a golem in uh, Lithuania uh, and uh, various uh, other places. However, um, you know some stories you can say were based on uh, your, uh, legends based on a real person or once there was a, a you know a, a very large man that lived and you know helped or something. I don't think I, I did not come in my research come across anything like that. You know, also let's uh, you know I want to get back to because I don't want you to be sad to go home sad. Uh, <laughs> the golem, you know, and I think somebody else was talking here about the the idea of metaphor characters being metaphorical. The golem is kind of a projection. Uh, uh, a magical. I mean, not only is he made and a projection of the rabbi and the rabbi's and is the rabbi's child, uh, but, but he is our projection, the reader's projection, the community's projection, the idea that somebody is going to come and save you. Now, what in that story, what he says is, no, I will help, but you are going to save yourself. Uh, you are all warriors. You're from warriors, uh, and you are going to save yourself and, and save your homes and save your families. So uh, it, he's, he's also the dream man, you know, the man of dreams in terms of Rochelle. You know, a, a, a big, strong, handsome, uh, you know, person who's going to give her uh, a sense of herself 
going to bring true love to her. So in a way, uh, even though he's, he's extremely physical and substantial, he is an almost an ethereal figure, a phantasm. And remember that the rabbi is also after his, uh, he wants to have a, a kind of a mystical union with God very much. Uh, he wants to have that ecstasy of, uh, and, and in a way the golem helps him achieve that. You know, when he enters the, ra the rabbi's household and, you know, it's always like, it's the least likely who, the third son or something, uh, the, the most, uh, the, the one who nobody thinks can, is capable, who, the one who's mute, the one who's dumb, the one who's ugly, the one who's, a, you know, who, who enacts a transformation in, in, in all of us. Well, thank you so much, Francis Sherwood. We were delighted to have you. I appreciate you being here. Okay, thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful stay in New York. I will. Um, you're staying a few more days, I mm -hmm. guess. And so enjoy our wonderful town. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great summer. And I look forward to seeing you back here in the fall. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.